friends, and welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who has also created his very own language, heard only by a select group of very lucky ladies, and known to the world as Bombgasm. It's Mr. Lord Bobgarden Lauren! <laughs> I think you got that all wrong, Brent. Bombgasm is an entirely different thing. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, well. It's not a language, it's an event. Oh. <laughs> It's a happening. That's exactly right. That only, as you said, a select ladies, few ladies have been privileged to. That's right. It's the kind of thing you, you sell tickets for and then uh, <laughs> people stand in line to witness. Uh, good evening, my friend. How are you? Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this. Thank you. I'm doing great, my friend. Uh, it's, uh, it's cold here. I say cold. Uh, well, I mean, you're in the north, so it, it's probably not as cold as you, but it was like 16 degrees last night, and that was, that was chilly. No, it's been down in the single digits, but this is my first uh, East Coast winter, and it is much colder here at five degrees yeah. than it is in Colorado at five degrees. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, is it like wind? Uh, like I'm wondering, like why? Why is there such a difference? It's something to do with the humidity, I'm told, or oh, something. Well, no, yeah, I, mean, that, I don't know. That, does, that, that, that does make sense. Yeah, Colorado is very, very dry. Yeah, uh, the moisture, the moisture does have a, has an effect. Yeah, man, it it, it is cold. Ooh. But I'll tell you what, Brent, what? it is hot up in here. Thank you to CES 2016. Yeah, there was some cool stuff this year. Uh, not all of it there video was. game related, but just uh, just neat stuff in general. But some of it was video game related. Uh, no, I bought I bought a Chevy Bolt. Oh, did you? <laughs> Which one? Did you get like a, did every, you get a fire extinguisher to go with it? Every single outlet that I can think of named Chevy Bolt their best in show. Yeah, well, considering how the Chevy Volt went, uh, I I would say uh, I, I would say just hang on to uh, the receipt is what I would say. Um, I think one of the things that I, that really caught my eye, and this is something like I can remember Tony and I talking about this years and years ago in relation to laptop gaming, but I loved what we saw from Razer that, uh, I like the stealth book or whatever they whatever they, uh, they call their, their Razer branded like laptop, but it's got like that, it's got like that separate GPU box that you can plug into the laptop and get, you know, like desktop class, uh, graphics, running on your laptop and like like you i can remember tony and i years ago talking to like oh like you know fucking apple should do that you know like you know you know break it out and you know have it like you know because you know their fucking thunderbolt cables could you know handle 10 gigabits of data a second or you know whatever it was and uh and that, that's like something i've always thought would have been like a really cool idea that was awesome to see from razor I, I thought that was a really neat uh product yeah the problem with that is you can't just create a new one every year and talk about how it's 200 megahertz better and sell it for another twelve hundred dollars it's, that, the, that, it's you, the electronics biz buddy they'll find a way that yeah there's no question about it there was some uh uh some interesting stuff i did notice we're obviously going to talk about virtual reality today yeah. and uh spoiler alert it's what we're talking about uh in the clubhouse <laughs> um but if you if you didn't know that last week but uh, uh, there's some crazy shit out there. There was a. Did you see the electric skateboard? Yeah, I did. The, the longboard. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk about obviously the price of the Oculus Rift. That was a big deal. The skateboard, this electric skateboard, fifteen hundred dollars. A lot of money. That is a lot I've, of cash. I bought a couple of cars for less than that. <laughs> I, know, I know. You know. I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, to be fair, though, when the electric skateboard runs out of gas, you can still keep riding. That's true. That's very true. You cannot do that now, with those it, cars it, it, you it's, bought. It's the magic of escalators. Like, if escalators break down, they're stairs, as Mitch, <laughs> as Mitch right. Hedberg so, so wisely observed. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. So we're going to talk about more of that uh, up in the clubhouse, like I said. But before we do, Brent, why don't we jump into the garage? I'm all about that. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued by this first story. Which is essentially, Brent, that a group of cunning linguists got together <laughs> and uh, apparently have created uh, their own language for Far Cry Primal. Yeah, well, it, it, I find this kind of stuff like really fascinating. Like, I remember, like, al- although I've never endeavored to learn it or anything like that, but I remember. Um, is this going to end up in uh, Klingon? Yes, it is. I, there, <laughs> there's a there's a special feature on. I guess it's the Star Trek Three. Search for Spock, you know, whatever, like the big, that first big Pooh Boss collector's edition they did of that, the double disc set. And there's like a little documentary on there with the guy that they hired, a linguist, to create the Klingon language. And he was talking about 
sort of the process of doing it and you know how it kind of came up with sort of like the the whole you know sort of grammar structure and the vocabulary and all that kind of stuff and i i don't know like i find that stuff riveting and i think i think it's the same guy that actually created the vulcan language stuff that you see in star trek 2 which was i think especially clever because in that scene with spock and savick they're actually speaking english and so he had to go back in and come up with sounds that would match the the lip movement you know like, like the phenomes uh but be different than the english dialogue that they were speaking and um i don't know there's something about like there's something about that i guess it's just because it's so far outside of my skill set or anything that i really understand that uh that i just find fascinating and i thought this is cool i thought it was like really really neat that somebody actually went back and sort of looked at ancient languages and said okay where might these have evolved from and then that kind of became the language of, of far cry primal I do think it's interesting. I, I wonder, uh, it, I mean, I don't know what they spent on this, but linguists do not come cheap. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Especially. <laughs> and this man knows what he's talking about. For, for, forgive me, but Brent just about spit out a glass of water yeah. while, uh, while, when I said that. Um, the I, You know, I wonder if it's worth the investment. I mean, it's a, it's a nice touch. I wonder if, uh, I, I don't know what they paid to have this done, but I wonder if it'll be a noticeable addition. Right. Uh, to the game or not well you know the, i don't know it's it's interesting there there is kind of a hollywood sort of quality to this in that you know like, like with feature films and stuff like you expect them to say something like oh yeah we uh we, we really wanted to film in this one location but uh you know it just wasn't quite right so we uh we we used helicopters to pick up an island and move it uh onto a glacier in iceland and then we dropped the island on top of the glacier and then we set it all on fire and that's how we got our that's how we got our set. Like you expect like those kinds of ridiculous stories like in the movie biz. And I don't know th- there is kind of a like there's a quality of that in, in this that, that just it's sort of like well it's Ubisoft they've got a lot of money and they can afford to invent a language for their video game. Uh <laughs> of course they can because it's going to be the release date will be updated. <laughs> soon uh yeah Yeah. so anyway it's i agree it's interesting it's an interesting story um moving on brent another interesting ubisoft story that's exactly right there is a rumor mind you it is a rumor still at this point Mm -hmm. to my knowledge that there will be no new assassin's creed coming in 2016 yeah which i for the first time in a while yeah they've been yearly for a while now and since assassin's creed 2 and i guess that there's also rumor although I, i don't I don't know what the source on this is, so I don't know how substantial it is. But there was also a rumor that the the next game not coming out this year is going to be set in ancient Egypt. Um, I do not know. I do not know the answer to that. Um, the, one of the other rumors with the, the reason that they are not coming out in 2016 is, is to make it more akin to The Witcher, right? Again, this none of this is verified. Not, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing. This is significantly rumor. But I do like the idea, if this ends up being true, Brent, that they will go a year without releasing the game in order to try and improve upon the game. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think that's great. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to fix, you know, sort of like my relationship with Assassin's Creed, although you're not the only person who's who's told me that they had a good time with Unity. And I've actually ended up going and watching. No, 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 no. Not with Unity. Not with, with Unity, Syndicate. Excuse me. Syndicate. Yeah. yeah, yeah pardon yeah, me. Yeah. With, uh, with Syndicate. And I've actually gone and watched some uh, some Let's Plays of Syndicate. As a result of you know kind of getting interested in it, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, the the setting definitely makes a it definitely makes a difference for me. I have to say, like you know, like a game set in ancient Egypt, something like that. I'd be interested in that. That that'd be really that'd be really really cool. I mean, you know, that's that's far enough back in history that uh, I, I I think that it would really be. I think it would really really be enjoyable to just you know be able to kind of inhabit you know like a living breathing world as we can sort of best imagine Egypt was in its heyday. I, I agree that it's interesting, but I, I do have to ask the question, Brent. Does the fact that I'm Jewish mean I'm just going to have to spend the whole game building pyramids? <laughs> yeah. Because that, I think, really would, would make it less of an enjoyable game for yeah, me. Yeah, there might be some PTSD issues there. <laughs> uh, no, I agree. I, I agree with you that I think it would be very interesting. Um, <laughs> 
Do you think all I, can, all I can see is my avatar just repeatedly saying, let my people go, right, right. let my people. Uh, no, I think it would be interesting. And, and, you know, I mean, a lot of the use I've seen multiple users over the last like two months say that because of my incessant talk of it and others on the website that they finally picked it up. Right. And that they were really enjoying it. And so that's good. Um, that's good. You and I have always loved the premise of the games and the idea of these historical adventures. Yeah. And just always the um, execution seemed on the weak side for the. Yeah. And so and, and you know, and nine games later or whatever it is, um, the execution does feel repetitive. But I totally enjoyed Syndicate. Would love to. Uh, as a matter of fact, I played it a little bit uh, last week or the week before, but um, I would love to see him wait until 20. I don't need an Assassin's Creed this year. Not at all. And I don't think anybody else does, honestly. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's my attitude as well. I, like, you know, we were talking about Uncharted before we started recording today. You know, there's a game series that I don't want to come out every single year. I, I don't want a new Uncharted game every year. I want them to take their time and make a, like one really, really good Uncharted game every several years. Every twelve, every thirteen months, yeah, well, <laughs> one really good, yeah. good Uncharted every right. thirteen every, months, every one point eight seven five. I can't, I, I don't, whatever, <laughs> whatever a twelfth is. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, I, I would love to, uh, I would, I would love to see, I would love to see Assassin's Creed, um, you know, maybe take a little bit more time. And if they, if they want to do a, l- a more Witcher like experience, I'm all about it. That's fine. Absolutely, can't be anything wrong with that. All right, Brent. So next up, we've got a PC release date yep. for Rise of the Tomb Raider. I thought we talked about this already. Did we already talk about a PC release date or no? Well, we talked about what that was supposed to be coming in January, but we have the... Oh, we got... We, we, had, the, we had Maybe that's what it was. We had, like, the release window. Or that it was coming... Right, exactly. Yeah. But now we know for sure that it's coming out on January 28th. Okay. For the PC. Wow. It <sighs> natively support 4K. Um, not that any of your computers will. No. But... Uh, Definitely not mine. <laughs> Uh yeah, so it's it's right around the corner, man. It's it's you know a couple weeks away at this point. I gotta check the specs um, on this to see if I have any hope of running it. Are you? Yes, I are you? Yes, I can definitely run this. Sweet. Are you planning? Are you planning to buy it or you know? Do you feel? I feel. I, I have to be honest that I feel a sort of sense of need to. I don't know if I will, but I feel a need to boycott it at least. To some degree, because of what they did by splitting the oh, right. the release so, the way they like, they've like, done it a year apart, just wait and buy it on PS4 just to kind of say fuck you, or I, I mean it, wait and wait three or four months to buy it on PC and get it for twenty nine ninety nine. Well, that's that's very true. I, I would say that okay. Here's here's the situation with this is that not I, from Green Man Game. I've got three. No, I've got three games that are all coming out really close to each other. First, you got Tomb Raider, then you've yep. got XCOM, then you got Firewatch. All in a, in a in a pretty narrow window, and I don't know if you care, but unravel. I uh, I probably won't pick that up day and date. No, oh, uh, but these three these these three could would all be like contenders for games. When is XCOM? XCOM is uh, let's see, it's like Ish. March the I want to say it's like the fifth or something like okay, that. Okay, so Firewatch and for me unravel are February 9th. right? And right. Uh, and what what did I say? I said March, like, like it's like February fifth or something like that. Right. So Firewatch, XCOM, and what was the other one? Uh. Rise of the Tomb Raider. Oh, oh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Okay. So, I've got Rise of the Tomb Raider, XCOM Two, and um, and Firewatch. All yeah, it's February fifth for XCOM Two. All coming out very, very close to each other, and so there's that classic sort of dilemma of how am I possibly going to get to all of these at the same time? Of those three games, I have to say that Rise of the Tomb Raider is the one I am the least not not interested in, but it's the one I feel the least need. To play immediately, I can right. I can let that game come out. I can wait for a few days and see how well is it running. Are they having any major problems? Is uh, you know, is is the is the new graphics card patches for the game? Are they working okay? I can I can hold off on, on that and find out. As opposed to like XCOM, where I really want to be playing that the second I can, and Firewatch basically the same way. So I kind of agree with you. I I, I feel like. Depending on what people are saying about Rise of the Tomb Raider on PC and how well it's running, I kind of feel like I could I could hold off a few months on that and pick it up cheaper as well. Yeah, there is a nice uh, collector's edition for the PC with a with a, p- a retail PC copy, a collectible steel case. Does it have a statue? It has a cool statue. Okay, actually, well then admit. it's a, it, uh, like it's not it's not actually a collector's edition if there's no statue. That's right, and there is, and that really pisses me off. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to figure out how to buy that bad boy. Oh, uh, of course. 
on eBay. Uh, all right, Brett. And last up in the garage this week, this is right up in your wheelhouse. And I put this on here yeah. just for you, baby. Thank you. Uh, it's a video, XCOM 2, the biggest changes between XCOM 2 and XCOM Enemy Unknown. Brent, you want to run these down? Because I'm sure you understand them in a way that I do not. Absolutely. Well, this, this is actually part of a series of, uh, of videos that PC Gamer has been doing leading up to the release of XCOM 2. Uh, I believe this is the third one that they've, they've, uh, they, they've put out just within the last week or so. And they're all really good. Uh, like one goes into character customization. The other one kind of talks about like 10 things, like 10 new things in XCOM 2. And this video, the, the one that details the biggest changes coming from XCOM Enemy Unknown, gives you an overview of how, how the game mechanics have sort of changed along with the new narrative foundation that XCOM 2 has. Uh, obviously, the whole premise of this game is that the aliens have, have won to a degree or another. They've taken over Earth, and so you no longer have the open support of all these nations of the world the way you did in XCOM 1. And as long as you were putting up satellites and protecting territory, people were sending you engineers and resources and all that. Very different uh, ball game this time around. You, you have to really scavenge, uh, scavenge for a lot more of those things, both resources and personnel. And this video breaks down how some of those things work within the game mechanics. They, call, they talk about how the decision of whether or not to do a mission that is all about gathering resources as opposed to a mission where you're going to be securing a scientist, the decision on which one of those to do is uh, it carries a lot more weight now because you don't have that uh, you don't have like that supportive nations to fall back on, and so you really have to weigh those things, especially early in the game, as they point out, where you don't really have a lot of anything when you're starting out, and so it just uh, you know it, it just gives you a little bit more of an insight into how XCOM Two is going to be different, and I, I'm really excited to play it. I love. The I love the character customization updates that they've talked about, and you should really watch that video. I'll try to find a link to it and put it in the show notes. But uh, that character customization video is really interesting, and there's so many cool options with that. And I think that some of the gameplay things, like the the whole fact that you can now operate in stealth, that you can be on the other side of the fog of war in uh, in this game, that is going to really, really change uh, some of the combat dynamics. And I like the fact that they talk about in general, it seems like the the missions they try to make a little bit more fast paced, so that it, as opposed to the the very slow, methodical kind of uh, pace that the the combat missions in XCOM Enemy Unknown had, I could not be more excited for this game. I, I mean, as you know, XCOM Enemy Unknown, one of my favorite games ever. I, I couldn't be more excited for this one uh, when it comes out on February fifth. Brent, is there, uh, of all of those things that you talked about, is there any one of those things that you think singly will affect uh, the gameplay more? I mean, certainly the fog of war thing is a big deal, the stealth aspect. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the um, and I played a little bit of XCOM uh, Enemy Unknown or and Enemy Within, but but not a ton. But the, the idea of the relationship of the, is it the engineers? Is that what it was? Yes, yeah. The, the engineers and, and to, to the rest of the game and how, you won't sort of just have all the engineers that no, you need. Like, like and you, you constantly need engineers. Like you're always right. going to need more engineers than you have. And, and then of course the, the, the way that the, uh, is it, and forgive me, psionics, is that? Yeah. That, that's um, the, that's the other big thing is that psionics is, is basically it's its own class now, like as opposed to being sort of like a, uh, like some abilities that go on top of whatever your class was, whether it was like, you know, like a sniper or like a heavy assault trooper or whatever. Now, like a, there's a psionics class that, uh, and like all of their abilities are are built around the psionics. There's new attacks, which means you can weapons. get the psionics earlier in the game yeah, too, as, much earlier. As they point out, yeah, you, you still now you still have to you still have to build the psionics lab. You still have to find recruits that have the the gift or whatever uh, in order to develop it. So that process kind of works the same way as it did in XCOM Enemy Unknown. It's just that you can basically start doing that from the beginning so d does any one of those things stand out to be as being more game changing than the other you know the one that sticks out in my mind is just the it, it, it's the the scarcity of resources the scarcity of personnel because that was something that not not so much early in the game but but later in the game that was one of those things that i felt uh i felt like uh 
it, it, it was kind of a juggling act. Like, like there, there, there was this sort of strategy to how you were going to spend your resources and what you were going to build in order to, you know, get your get your weapons upgraded and and just kind of keep your keep your squad uh, combative on on the field. You, you know, you'll keep them like up to spec so that they weren't getting squashed. And the fact that that is going to be even more challenging. That's the thing that stands out to me as as probably really fundamentally changing your approach to the game. But I don't do know. You think I, we'll see. Do we'll you think I, do you get the impression I needed to play the first? Like I, I, one would needed to have played the first game? No, I, I don't think yeah. so. I mean, I mean, I think that I think that the first. Like I was thinking honestly about going back and playing the first game, like over the next couple of weeks before two comes out, and then I I kind of second guessed myself and said, well. What if the second game is so different that I end up kind of biasing myself in a way? Like I go into the second game trying to play it like the first game, right, and that yeah. puts me at a disadvantage. Yeah, I have a feeling. I, I know how passionately you enjoyed this game, and I have a feeling it, it comes out, like you said, on February 5th. Um, and so I actually can't see you getting Lara Croft, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Because this game, I'm assuming, will... I mean, you put hours and hours and hours into the original. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's hundreds. I, I mean, I did, I've did. i done a complete playthrough of the like the story mode like three times, I guess. I cannot believe I've never played that game. You know, I don't know. Like, it's it's like I, I tried to get uh, another friend of mine into it, Ace, and he, he messed with it. And he was just like, no, it's too slow paced. Like, you know, I, I only like real time strategy. And uh, I don't know. Like, like, for whatever reason, some people just don't really... Some people just don't really, you know, enjoy like maybe that style of gameplay or whatever. But uh, yeah. man, it's just it's so in my wheelhouse. Yeah, well, I'm excited. I'm excited for it to come out for you, so you have something else to play with besides yourself. <laughs> Welcome back to the clubhouse, and we actually uh, we've got a discussion topic this week. As Lauren warned you about at the top of the show, it is VR-related uh, because we have quite a bit of VR stuff to talk about between the Oculus Rift pre-orders and some of the things we saw at uh, CES 2016. There's some interesting VR talk in the air. But before we get to that, we don't have a poll that we can share the Thanks, results. Brent. Yeah, We don't have a poll that we can share the results uh, on, but we... Mostly because I think you were scared to put up a poll that says... Are you glad that Brent and Lorna are in the show? <laughs> yes, very. Yes, extremely. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, like I, I was, you know, like I, I was, I was trying to think of like how I would frame that question. I just couldn't come up with anything that wasn't uh, that wasn't either wildly inappropriate or just uh, just completely lame. But anyway, the we did not have a poll about uh, our discussion last week, which was on uh, the end of uh, Outlaw Gamer Radio as a weekly podcast. But uh, that didn't stop you guys from letting us know how you felt. And we just wanted to take a moment here to let you guys know that we, we've read every one of those comments at this point and uh, that it was, it was exceptional. It was exceptional to, to listen to what you had to say and to find out about you know, how much the show, the community, and... and, and and Lauren and I, as, as well as you know Tony and Daniel, going back to the uh, Epic Battle Axe days, how, how how much that's uh, that that's meant to some of you. That that's uh, on the one hand, it's it's difficult for me to it's difficult for me to understand that because you know it's just I don't know like like I'm I'm always surprised when people when people say how much the sh- you know the show is meant to them, and I'm just like like our show like the show that we do. But uh, it's it's so it's so gratifying and rewarding to uh, to know that you know the show means something to people. So I just uh, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you very much to everyone who uh, who shared their thoughts. It, it was uh, very very gratifying to to know that uh, doing this show has connected with people, and that uh, that's that's pretty awesome. Lauren, I know that you wanted to say something as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, Brent, and I, I just want to uh, extend my personal gratitude and thanks. And it really, it, it's so powerful and meaningful. I love, there's nothing more that I love than hearing people's personal stories about what uh, this show uh, or Epic Battle Axe has meant to, to you and how you listen to it. Even if it's just like, I listen to it every week when I'm running on the treadmill, or yeah. um, I, I do know 
um, how meaningful these shows can be. I, I, I listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of podcasts back in the day um, prior to doing my own show and uh, was brought to Epic Battle Axe, the website, because Epic Battle Cry was such a great uh, a podcast. And, and I've listened to just thousands of hours of podcasts and and I do know how meaningful they can be. And to hear your personal stories about, um, again, how you listen to them, hard times that it's got you through, that you think of us as friends, which I definitely want you to, and uh, how that's offered consistency. Especially I love, when you know, we have pe- to start asking to borrow money. <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, uh, listening to, to people you know, who say uh, just the, the kindest, most wonderful things about like the quality of the show, the quality of the community, um, you know, how we're the only podcast you listen to or how much it's meant to you or, you know, uh, people who have, who make games because of the show, which is just astounding to me. Yeah, that always blows um, my mind. Uh, s- stuff like that is just, it, it, it's so incredible. And we had some first time posters, you know, say I've never gotten on before, but when you guys announced this, I, I really felt the need to get on and, and just share my gratitude or my experience or, or whatever. And we're just, we're so grateful for it. And it's so it's so special and we read every comment and we'll continue to do so. And, and I just, I cannot thank you guys enough for your support and your love and, and your love for each other and your love for the medium. Um, a lot of people, you know, asking about um, giving Brent ideas, uh, which is great. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, interesting too, because like at least one, one person, maybe two, like basically like laid out exactly what I'm kind of like been sketching out myself They said, Oh, like Brent should do a show like this, 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 this. And I was like, well, that's actually exactly what I'm thinking about doing. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. So I do. Well, well, you won't be getting weekly content from us and I'm not doing, um, we're not doing a thing where we're saying, well, maybe we'll try a different format and maybe we'll go, we'll do a YouTube. We're not sort of petering out, trying to figure out what we're doing. What we are doing is what we said before, which is the website's not going away as long as it's supported. And, and, uh, we, we, because of that, we will continue to make content when we feel like it. And, and, uh, you know, with this outpouring of love, I think I will certainly, we'll talk about VR in a minute, but I will do an unboxing for, uh, for the, uh, Oculus Rift. I, I, my guess is Brett and I are going to want to talk about Uncharted 4 because I think yeah. that's a game we're both going to play and we'll probably, both play through chances are um, good. No promises, but Brent and I always get a little giddy when it comes to E3. Um, and so I do think, you know, don't take us off your RSS feeder or your, your um, uh, uh, podcatcher or whatever it is that you're using uh, to listen to our show, because I, I, I w- there's no promises. We don't know how it's going to end up. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe we're quiet for a little while right after the show ends in January. Um, and eight months from now, you might get three shows in a row just because we both feel like it because we miss you guys or whatever. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe you will still get content from us. I don't know how much or how often, but we love you guys so much. And the outpouring of love has made it that much harder, uh, to bring the show to it, to, to a close, um, here at the end of January. But a- a- anyway, just, just thank you guys so much. And, and, uh, we love you too. Yes. All right, so uh, Lauren, you just teased that you were going to do an unboxing for the Oculus Rift, which I suppose I means that you must have pre-ordered the Oculus Rift. Oh, I pre-ordered that bitch. Oh, so tell me all about it. Oh, did I pre-order that bitch? And t- let me tell you what, I was pissed because it took me about 30 minutes to pre-order it um, because they were having website issues. And so now no, really? my, my ship date slipped into April, which considering the original ship date was March 28th, it isn't really that bad. Yeah. Uh, I don't know a day in April, but um, it's yeah. It's so like whatever day November is, it's that day in April. It's uh, um, so, uh, and now here I am back in this goddamn game of waiting for my Oculus Rift. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, you guys know at CES, Oculus Rift uh, has been officially the first virtual reality headset consumer version to announce a release date and release price. Um, and it is going to start shipping on March 28th for the price of $599. Uh, for that $599, you get the Oculus Rift headset complete with the uh, spatial audio specially designed headphones, um, the uh, Xbox One controller. They have included a remote, which is a very basic remote that has like play pause functionality, basically. Uh, to allow you to interact with media without having to use the game controller. Uh, and then the... Um, 
Oculus Rift sensor, uh, which is what allows you to do positional tracking. Um, we knew there wasn't going to be the Oculus Touch motion controller controls in there. Um, so it's exa- and then they they uh, also a carrying case, like a really nice kind of carrying case. So uh, five ninety nine. I won't lie to you that I was sitting there right at that moment, which was eleven a.m. my time, hitting refresh uh, when uh, when the price was coming out and the pre-orders opened up, and I was there was some sticker shock. Yeah, uh, and I it's hesitated a for for about one hundred and twenty seconds because <laughs> I was not, you know, my wife and I were having talks about like, can I buy this thing, honey? Can I buy it? And I was really expecting can we afford this and something more like three fifty or four hundred. And when it went on sale, she was nowhere to be found, so I had to make a decision. Yes, um, very quickly, and I, I hesitated for about why, two minutes. Which is why you're broadcasting tonight from the Motel Six down the street. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, I hesitated for about two minutes, and I thought, uh, who am I kidding? Number one. I'm not going to do anything but anguish over this for the next month and end up ordering it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and number two, uh, I, I am not t- typically a technology early adopter, right? but v- virtual reality in particular moves me in such a way that I want to have it. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and it's not, you know, um, I, and that was the decision. I'm not, I am not wealthy. I am not, uh, I'm staunchly middle class, which is, Depending on what you're talking about, like what country standards you're talking about, that some might consider that wealthy. But I'm not a wealthy man. Um, but I decided no, that. I mean, look at that sweater. Come on. That's exactly right. Um, I decided that I was going to do it, so I bought it. My computer is already 100 percent ready. I don't have to buy anything else but the Rift itself. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm very, very excited. Well, I'm excited for you. I, I, I always thought that I'd be joining you on this, but. Um I also am not a wealthy man, except I am even more not- <laughs> of not a wealthy man. Well, you ha- look, man, you made your choices. You, that's right. I chose virtual reality. You chose a daughter. Chose, that was that's on you. Chose is a broad word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I, uh, I I I do not have the money to uh, to buy an Oculus. Well, and okay, here's the thing: well, if it was well, just oh, the hold Oculus on, hold on, hold on. Let's be clear that I knew, I also don't have the money to buy an <laughs> Oculus Rift, but I'm figuring out a way to finance yeah. it. Um, I, I I do not have the uh, I do not have the money to get an Oculus Rift, and even if if it was just the Rift, I might be able to swindle some kind of some kind of situation where I, where I could maybe get one. But I'm in that situation where I not only need a Rift, but I also need. A new uh, a new motherboard and processor. I, I like. I would need to get my computer fully up to spec. That's a few running. hundred dollars more. So yep. yeah, I mean, like I'm talking about like maybe nine hundred dollars instead of just yep. six hundred dollars. Just yeah. six hundred dollars. So that uh, that knocks me out of the early adoption window for this thing, and it leaves me looking at uh, basically the uh, basically the the PlayStation VR and and looking to see what that what that ends up being priced at. I'm very very interested. In VR, I'm desperate to experience it for myself, but uh, cost being what they are, it looks like I'm going to have to hold off just a little bit longer. Well, it's interesting. So there, there's a lot of chatter around this, obviously, Brent. They were the first to announce it. Uh, we just found out today, the day of this recording, that uh, HTC has said they will un- open up pre-orders for the Vive yep. uh, on February 29th. Now, they, they showed off a development kit at CES. The, they did. Uh, it's called the Vive Pre, and actually, yeah, it won almost. So it won almost all of the sort of best gaming or best VR things because of their. It's and it's really interesting. It's so interesting to watch this back and forth happen. Um, so their big their big uh, reveal was that they now have a front facing camera uh, on their on their headset that allows you to and, and with their. Um, and this isn't the necessarily big reveal, but with their headset comes what they're calling the lighthouses. It's two cubes that you put in different areas of the room, right. so it allows you to walk around the entire room. And the idea is that the camera on the front is going to be able to offer you sort of like an augmented reality experience in reverse, as opposed to like looking through the lens and having things projected on reality. No, actually, so what they were showing off was uh, mostly two things. One, that how the camera interacts what they call the, with what they call their, their chaperone system. Okay. Uh, and this is something that alerts you when you are, if you're walking around a room in which you have this set up yeah. and you're having a VR experience, um, you can use the camera to designate 
um, the area, uh, what, sort of the playable area. And so when you walk towards and get close to a wall or your desk or something else, yeah. it will alert you in the VR. Oh. So the other thing they're using it for is some pass-through, some sort of modified pass-through where you can see the world around you. So if you wanted to look at, if somebody walked in and you wanted to talk to them, yep. you could see through the camera and see those people in this sort of wireframe representation. But enough so, it's not a one-to-one like pass-through, like looking through a camera lens. Okay. It, it's more of like a bluish wireframe representation, but it's detailed enough that you can tell who's who, the difference between people. You could read signs on the wall. So it, it allows you to see the world around you, but not exactly the way you would if you were looking through a camera lens. Okay. And they're not really demonstrating or talking much about using it for any kind of AR, whether it's projecting virtual objects on the real world outside of you or bringing objects into your... They're not, they weren't really demoing any of that. Okay. So it, it, it's really interesting because Palmer uh, Lucky, the founder of Oculus, has said that um, the def- the chaperone piece of that, the defining of spaces, is more about software than it is about the camera, and that I, I intimated that they too would be able to do this right. without the camera. So um, when you buy the Oculus Touch uh, um, controllers, it comes with a second um, Oculus sensor, the one that sits on the desk yeah. and gives you tracking. And so ostensibly, you could put the second sensor in another place in the room and create room size VR. Right. Um, and he is, without explicitly saying it, has said in a couple interviews, you know, capturing like playable area and having a chaperone type thing. He didn't say those words. Is it's all in software. It's super easy to do, and it doesn't require a camera, basically. Right. Uh, now the pass through piece of it obviously so would require they, a camera. So, but the, the question there is, so why haven't they done it? If it's really, well, if it's my, really my, easy, and because my feeling is that this is just my feeling based on the myriad of interviews that I've watched is that it's going to require the touch controllers and that second uh, sensor, which they're not releasing right. for another several months. So maybe months. not the camera, but it, but probably the two sensors. That's my that's my guess. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so that that's that's my guess. So the the, the and the pass through. So, but everybody said it was like a it was a experience uh, a VR cha- uh, changing experience to be able to move around the room like that. Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, which is cool. That's very very cool. And everybody said that the, the Vive is. Uh, looking good quality. Um, the Vive, unlike the Oculus Rift, the Vive will ship with two motion controllers. Yeah. That they um, demoed some new versions of that, which were very well received. They, lo- they look they look interesting too. Like not at all what I mean. Not that the Oculus Rift controllers look like what I thought they would, but the the Vive controllers look even quite a bit different than they did. Yeah, the Oculus controllers just from looking at them seem like a step forward and look like they make sense for VR yeah. a little bit. These look like modified nunchucks a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody said they're, they, they worked great and that they were comfortable. So um, I will say, Brent, I, I, you know, I'm, I am uh, personally, just as an aside, I, I'm personally somewhat loyal to Oculus because I like what they're doing. I like Palmer Lucky. I, I like the, well, and, and the they tenor really of the company. And they this trail. I mean, they did in a big way. Nobody else ever did VR, but Oculus, is, I mean, they are the company that really, really got... The industry and and customers excited about VR. I, I mean, like the reason that HTC is doing this and the reason PlayStation is doing this has a lot is to because do of with them. Oculus. And from what I can see, I, I'm I'm inclined to support them until I have a reason not to. Right. Um, just from a from a, a brand loyalty standpoint, I believe in them, what they stand for. I believe in Palmer. Um, I believe that the support feels like it's going to be better. There's questions about HTC's stocks are just plummeting and plummeting and plummeting and. Some people are concerned that it may not exist in a year. It's been that significant. Yeah. And there's tons of articles on that. You guys should look it up if you're interested. Um, so I'm inclined to, to uh, give Oculus my support until there's a reason not to. That being said, um, I have not paid for the Oculus Rift yet. They do not charge you yeah. until you purchase, until the day that, until they ship your set. Yeah. And, and you can get a, a cancel your order at any time. So I could easily cancel my order on February 29th. If if uh, HTC puts up a, a comparable product now, some questions about HTC. So number one, just to be, just talk to be about clear, this. that is when the pre orders start for the Vive Pre, February 29th, yeah, Yes. Okay. Um, so there's a few things that are sort of people don't talk a lot about the fact that Oculus has this integrated audio headset uh, with, with spatial audio drivers, which I think is going to end up being a very much bigger deal yeah. 
than people think it is. And um, I, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. When you, I mean, you and I, you know, because yeah. and and there are people you either have seen this or you haven't. If you've ever watched a rough cut of a movie, particularly a famous movie that you might recognize, without uh, the proper sound and the music associated with it, you recognize how how much sound and music contributes to the overall end product of what we're watching. Um, and so I think that's going to be hugely important. Uh, and if HTC isn't including that, and you to get that high-end experience, you would have to buy high-end headphones, that's, that's something that's not being talked about a lot, and I'm not really sure why, honestly. Um, the other piece of it is, of course, we don't know the price of the HTC. And there are many people who think it's going to come in uh, higher, if not significantly higher, than the Oculus Rift. And so that will, I'm curious to see how that shakes out as well. Right. And certainly, I don't think, um, I think it would have to come in at least $100 cheaper to convince me to buy the HTC Vive over the Oculus Rift um, without knowing, of course, what all the, the specs are at the end. But um, anyway, that's, I mean, that's kind of the state of those. The PlayStation VR, you know, <laughs> um, uh, Kaz Harai tweeted um, something along the lines of, I should have pulled it up before we got into this, something along the lines of, he wrote, Oculus Rift, a headset that will take you into the virtual world, you know, virtual worlds where somebody would pay $599 for a VR headset. So after that sort of and, smart-ass and imaginary tweet... imaginary place. Right, so, I, I, so, so after that smart-ass tweet, I have to assume the PlayStation VR is going to be $499. Oh, no, this is Sony. I, I, I mean, you know... Like like Sony, Sony could could literally come out with something that's five ninety eight, and and still and still and be, say how much cheaper yeah, it was. Still be cheeky enough to uh, to to send that tweet. Yeah, you know. So I don't know, Brent. I mean, I, I was absolutely taken aback, and there's no doubt that six hundred dollars is expensive. Yeah. Uh, Palmer Lucky insists that it's probably one of the best deals in consumer electronics. That it's insanely cheap for what it is component wise. Right. Um, but it is expensive and. You know, there's been a lot of comparisons. You know, the first iPhones that came out were five hundred dollars on contract, yeah. six or seven hundred off contract, um, and then people are quick to point out that, yeah, but at least you didn't have to have another device to hook it up to, and yeah. which is true. But the, you know, the skateboard thing, yeah, but, I mentioned is fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, like but it's it's like the whole thing with, uh, I mean, it's like you know, four K TVs or you know, a three D TV. It's like yeah, you know. Uh, you know, you're going to have to have the, the, the TV and you're going to have to have the 4k Blu-ray player and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, right. You've got to pay for service or right. People made, that's just people the made the comparison the about, yeah, exactly. And people made the comparison about like, sure. The, the cell phone is a standalone device that's $600, but it's a brick unless you have cell phone service. Yeah. So you're going to spend another, you know, eight, 50 to $80 a month for ever using that thing and so there is an additional cost and so you know the bottom line is it, it's early tech and you're either an early adopter or you're not um yeah. and um you know it, it's the same like you said 4k tvs are you know whatever they are this year or last year and three years from now they won't be that anymore and and um you know that's just that's the way vr is right now and you can you know i think the issue and palmer lucky you know god love him 23 year old kid if he lives with five other people he's worth m- I can't even imagine how much this guy is worth. He lives with five other people. Um, and dresses like, you know, <laughs> a- better, anybody better than you. Let's be honest. N- not really. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, God love him. He came out and he said, "You know what? I fucked up. I I I didn't manage expectations right, and we should have done a better job. This is what I thought. It's my fault for saying it this way. You know, the problem is, is that they set expectations around three hundred and fifty bucks." And this is not around 350 bucks to people, to the normal consumer. Yeah. To Palmer Lucky, who is used to, you know, old v- the, the most recent, even semi-legitimate VR headsets were $10,000 a pop. 600 bucks is in the neighborhood of 350 bucks as compared to a $10,000 unit. Right. Um, and he recognized it. He admitted it. He said I, it was bad expectation management. But this isn't out of line with all other new emerging high end tech, it's just as a way this happens. Yeah, well, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I have to say that I six hundred dollars was more than I thought it was going to be. Also, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of feel like as early as this is, it costs what it costs. You know, and I know that people, you know, I know that people think that you know, like the PlayStation's, like, ah, eh, you know, they're talking like three hundred and fifty, and I'm thinking it's probably closer to four hundred or, or north of four hundred. You know. 
for PlayStation VR. That would be my guess, but we don't know yet, and we're going to find out in the next couple of months. Yeah. You know, Palmer was he was really quick to point out too, like, you know, we yet yeah, we could have delivered a unit at four hundred dollars. It would have been the DK two. It wouldn't give you the experience that we're going to give you. There's less right. presence, less blah blah blah. We could have done that, but the limiting factor here is not the headset. The limiting factor is the computer you need to run it. Yeah. And you still need the same computer almost to run the DK2. And so uh, what we would have done was brought down the price from $1,500 all in to $1,300 all in. And that difference is not going to get the mass market, the, 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 the widespread consumer, to get into VR. I think that I think they're making the, the, the right... Like, they're betting on the right thing in the sense that, yeah, it's a lot of money, and it's going to close off the Oculus. I, I mean, like, like you and I, you know, like, it's, it, it, the Oculus is within your reach, not within my reach, you know? Like, the, the, it, the, it is going to have sort of a, a line in the sand quality where there's some people who are just not going to be able to get it. But I think that they are correct to bet on the experience and the Jess Condit linked to an article uh, from her Facebook feed. I can't remember if it was, I, I, I think it was an Engadget article that s- somebody else had written. But they were talking about what people are underestimating with the six hundred dollar price is the magic of VR. They they are forgetting. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a Polygon uh, article it, actually. It, it, maybe maybe or, it was. Or there was one. Yeah. But um, but the point is that they were talking about people will pay six hundred dollars for the magic that VR brings them and i think that they are right to have the price be what it is but to really really be betting on the experience of vr being worth it and for the word of mouth that it's worth it to spread well they're and they're going to be putting rifts in retail for people to try yeah. and that's exactly it you can't it, it, it the closest analogy i can come up with in our lifetimes is the difference between having high speed internet and not having it yeah and until you have high speed internet you don't understand how it can integrate into your life. And I don't know for those of you that are old enough to remember having dial up, there's a moment <laughs> when you switch over to having high speed internet in your home. That's when you begun to actually use the internet as a tool to answer every question you ever had. Yep. Forget streaming video and all that. That didn't even exist back when, when high speed internet first debuted, but it was more about like anything you could think of. You could go to the internet and look it up in an instant before that. The internet wasn't a useful tool in that regard. And so you couldn't understand that. And I happened to be a computer tech at the, the, the top period of time when that, was, that transition was actually happening. Um, and I used to tell clients about that. You can't understand high-speed internet until you have it. Yeah. And VR, it's, a, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it's the closest one I can come up with. Or, or maybe being a parent. You, know, like yeah. you, you can talk about being a parent all day long, just, and I can theorize on it, but until you have a child... You can't know until you know. You have no understanding of what that connection with that kind of other being yeah. feels like. There's no other connection I can, in human I can relate to experience that. That, that, that rival, that, that, that mimics that. So until you actually have that, and, and, and VR, not that I'm comparing VR to having a child, <laughs> but I am. But I did VR have that is choice, the, is, is what but, you're but saying. But VR is, the, VR is the same thing. Until you put it on your head and experience it, you don't understand. Yeah. You think you do, and you don't. Um. And it is, and that's, and they're counting on that, and it's true. And there are several articles out there that say you guys can like bluster all you want about price and how this kills VR coming to the masses, and but you're you're all leaving out one thing, and that's VR is utter magic. Yeah, yeah, and, and it is. And so you know, I'm very excited. I am as much as I am an Oculus supporter, and as much as I, you are going to have to convince me to not buy an Oculus and buy something else. Um, I am intrigued to see what comes out of HTC uh, over the course of um, the coming months, what comes out of PSVR uh, over the course of the coming months. I'm curious what they're doing. Certainly, there looks like a lot of games um, on, on each platform. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I'm super excited. Like, there's so much VR now, and now i got to sit here and wait another three months. Yeah, but it's only three months. I mean, I can, I mean, like, you and I were talking about how badly we wanted VR back when we read Ready Player One years ago, and 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 like there were like at that time there wasn't really anything on the horizon, you know, like the Oculus and and you know like stuff John Carmack was talking about, and then later the Oculus, like those all seemed to kind of happen, uh, you know, in the aftermath of that, 
And so, yeah, that was, I think that was 2011, late 2011, early was somewhere around. Yeah. There. So, we, I mean, when you think about how long we've actually been waiting and the fact that this year, I think we're actually going to start to see the foundation of, of our, our kind of aspirations for what VR can be. I think the foundation for that starts getting, getting put down this year. It does indeed, man. And I, you know, I, the, the reality is, is I know that, that I'm probably going to end up buying another Oculus Rift in two years you know yep. i'll be happy if it's three um and, and at that point they'll probably be three hundred dollars and not six right sure um i i know that and, and i am not wealthy enough to to like casually just go but so what but this is so this is that sort of um i, I to me this is that this is that paradigm it's shifting important. and that powerful experience that that there's a few things in my life that sometimes you got to say what the fuck like with scientology <laughs> <laughs> all right guys we're gonna hit the road put the pedal to the metal and talk about some of the games we've been playing this week lauren is gonna go first uh whew, more shenanigans in battlefield 4 man <laughs> uh, please tell me you've returned it again uh no 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 Nothing no no actually playing the game. Here. I thought you were gonna give me shit for talking about it again, and I was gonna say really because I see Star Wars. You Commander better fucking on here. talk about it, considering you bought the goddamn thing twice. You uh, better be no, talking man, about more that shenanigans game. with my friends. I, I'm digging. I missed playing online with people, yeah. um, and I am just having tons of fun playing online with people and the game. I'm loving the game, playing it fun. Shenanigans, C4, jeeps, helicopters, tanks, nighttime maps. I can't. It's it's tons of fun. Tons of fun. Cool. Glad. That's all I got for you. I don't want to. I mean, I could, I could, I could, no, I could. You can uh, stop now. That's fine. No, I mean, no, I, I mean, really stop. <laughs> uh, I could drench you in my tales of ribaldry, don't, but. Don't, don't drench me in anything, man. Fair I, enough. I, as long as your Star Wars Commander talk is the same length I, as my Battlefield 4 talk. I like you a lot, but, you know, you don't need to drench me in anything. <laughs> oh. Uh, I, so I played a little bit of Disney Infinity this week. Not much. Because like what I really need to be doing is I need to be capturing uh, game footage for the uh, the forthcoming YouTube much video? teased YouTube uh, head to head between Disney <laughs> much Infinity teased. and Lego Dimensions. But unfortunately, my laptop is uh, is currently I'm actually checking the uh, tracking information as we speak. My laptop is in transit to a repair center. To uh, there's some sort of it, it's the screen oh, like no. started like glitching out on me, like going like all fuzzy and stuff. Uh, and so I had to send it off to get it fixed. So I don't have any way to capture game footage at the moment. But uh, I played a little bit of Disney Infinity, but I'm kind of holding off on that until I can actually do something useful with it. So playing Star Wars Commander. Started a squad in Star Wars Commander, which is uh, like I've never, I've never messed around with that at all. But uh, I got kind of curious about it. And so I started up a squad. And if you're playing Star Wars Commander, you can join the squad. It's called Epic Outlaws, one word. And it's, uh, it's an Imperial squad. So you're gonna be playing Empire to join, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's cool. There's there's a couple of uh, big tournaments going on right now. One on Hoth, one on. Right, I think actually the one on uh, Tatooine starts in a few days. But um, so yeah, playing Star Wars Commander. If you are playing Star Wars Commander on the Imperial side and you want to join the squad, just uh, you got to like go in and search for Epic Outlaws, and it's request only thing. So just send a request. And send a note, like, let me know that uh, that you sent a request and that you're a listener on the show and all that stuff. And I'll approve you. And it, once you join a squad, what you could do is, like, you can request troops. So, like, if, if you're having a hard time with something, you can request some troops. And I will, I will train up some troops from my garrison, and then they'll be available to you on your, on your base. So if anybody comes and attacks your base, uh, those troops I donated can, uh, can have your back. And... If you're like a lower level, then that might help you out because you know, like I've got like level nine stormtroopers and shit, so uh, that might uh, that might work out okay for you. But anyway, so you can kind of help each other out. There's a there's a, a slight kind of social aspect to that, but I also think that uh, you can. I think as you, I think it's like you gain medals and stuff. Like I think there's certain achievements that you uh, that you can get, you know, by uh, donating and receiving troops and everything through the squad system. So anyway, check it out. Epic. Can I play as uh, Epic Outlaws? One word. Can I play as uh, Finn or Ray or? You can't play as Ray in a game. Come on, Lord, that'd be stupid. Have you not seen that controversy? Uh. Uh-uh. Yeah. So there was a. Um, <laughs> there was a. I, I, I think there were a couple of things, but I think the one that's gotten all the focus is there was a Monopoly game 
uh, Star Wars themed Monopoly game that was put out, and the game actually came out prior to the film, and it's got uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, Darth Vader, Finn, and Kylo Ren, I think. And everybody's like, where the fuck is Rey? <laughs> like, you know, she's she's kind of an important character in the new film. Why isn't she in this game? Like, you know, and spoilers, Darth Vader ain't in this fucking movie because he's dead, you know? So why, you know, like, why isn't, you know, like, this one really important character in this game? And, you know, there's a lot of people who feel like it's just the toy industry yet again ignoring the demographic of women and, and girls. And, uh, you know, Hasbro's like, well, you know, like, it, it was before you know, the movie came out and... You know, we we didn't want any spoilers, and we were afraid if we, you know, like included this character who was in all the fucking trailers, that it was somehow going to spoil the movie. And so now, uh, uh, unlike including, I mean, unlike including uh, Finn, Finn. Finn. It was also in all the fucking because trailers we didn't, and an important right, character but in the movie. We didn't necessarily know like the size of Finn's role in the movie versus exactly. the size of Ray's role in the movie. Oh, yeah, it, it was just bullshit. So anyway, I call it bullshit. But, now I'm changing my into the sunset now to be a to be outlaw gamers protest Hasbro. Yeah, well, you'll I'm be kidding. joining J.J. Abrams on that one. He's he's also called bullshit. But anyway, it was, there was just this whole controversy about it's like like you guys got to stop doing this. Like, like this is not the first time. Like there's an like there's an Avengers set out there that's like it's the like the Quinjet and like the motorcycle scene from Avengers: Age of Ultron, where uh, uh, Scarlet uh, or not Scarlet Witch, Black uh, Black Widow <laughs> is on the uh, the. Well, I was about to say Black Cat. And I'm like God, you know, like too many fucking comic book movies, but. Uh, where Scarlett Johansson is on, Hansen, is on a fucking yes. motorcycle, and there's like a toy that they released of that, and there's no Scarlett Johansson to be found. It's like Captain America, like on the motorcycle. It's like Captain America's not even in a fucking scene. Like he didn't show up until later, you know? And it's, it's just like the, this bullshit thing, like with the toy industry. Like they gotta stop, they gotta stop assuming that the only people who are gonna buy these things are, are boys, you know? Right. Like there, there's yeah. more and more women showing up in these movies, and girls are, you know, in theory, getting more and more interested in that. And so you gotta, you know, you gotta have both, and it's just. Uh, well, there you go. I, I, you know what? I, I appreciate you explaining that to me. I didn't know, and I therefore, now that I know, I will certify your previous joke is funny. All right, thank you. Um, all right, Brent. So we're gonna head into the sunset. We got a couple of things this week. Uh, mine's a little more fun than yours. I'm not happy about yours, and I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, but, no kidding. Uh, mine, Brent, is a link to uh, for you guys to check out. There's this new Fallout Four mod. That I haven't tried yet, but I just I just saw this uh, earlier today, looks, and it looks fucking looks awesome. Looks damn good. Uh, somebody has taken Fallout Four and essentially uh, created a mod, a filter for it that that creates a uh, cel shaded graphics, yeah. a la Borderlands, it looks and it dope. looks just it looks so so cool, and it 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 totally makes me want to go back and play the game. And it so, made me want to go back and play Borderlands. That was the real that's the real tragedy here. Yeah, you guys need to click on this link and check it out. It looks super dope, and if anybody plays it, I want to hear about it. Uh, and when I get a chance to go back to Fallout 4, amongst all the other games I have right now, uh, um, I definitely want to check it out. So uh, cell shaded graphics for Fallout 4, awesome sauce, mods, love it. Yep, it's good times. What is not good times is that for the second week in a row in the Into the Sunset section of the show, we are talking about a fallen rock god. Uh, I guess it was this morning that, that I saw the news, David Bowie, dead at 69 from cancer. He's been, uh, he's been battling cancer for the last 18 months. I, I really, I didn't know that he was sick and I, I don't know if that was out there and people, no, he kept it. He kept it. Secret. But, uh, I had no idea he was sick and I just like my wife and I were watching, we were watching the tonight show on, on Hulu this week. And, you know, we, we saw, uh, Jimmy Fallon. Showing off the new album, Black Star, that uh, Bowie just put out, and like I think he was going to be on the show either this week or or next week or something like that. But I mean, he was like going to be on to perform at some point, and and I remember thinking like, oh, I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, and it's never going to fucking happen now, and that it, it's rough, man. Like Bowie, Bowie's a really interesting character in my mind, um, not like hugely influential on me throughout his whole career, but like there's certain songs and things that that I really, really dig from him. But the thing about Bowie, I remember having this conversation with my good buddy, uh, Benjamin Zayas years ago, we were talking about that whole thing of like, you know, like actors want to be musicians, musicians want to be actors, but you know, like no actor, you know, is ever going to be as good a musician as they are an actor and vice versa, that kind of thing. But we said like the one exception of that is David Bowie. Like he's the one guy who is equally as good as an actor as he is as a musician. And the guy was a, 
amazing. He was an amazing musician. I, he was an artist. I mean, like, like David Bowie, in the truest sense of the word, David Bowie was an artist. He was a really, really fascinating and creative guy. He was indeed, and he, he was a huge part of the soundtrack of my youth, Brent. Uh, and this is this was particularly uh, devastating for me. I really, I mean, in, insofar as you know, the death of somebody who you're, you're you don't know personally yeah. uh, can be. Robin Williams was obviously uh, just a, a, a you know a, a big shock, and David Bowie is is a hundred percent up there for me with sort of Robin Williams. I I, I grew up uh, listening to David Bowie, and he his music is uh, it just uh, inextricably entwined with so many of like the sentinel moments of, of my, my youth and, and after my youth, uh, um, and we, you know, one thing that has always, that I, it, this is the dumbest thing of all the wonderful, wonderful, uh, David Bowie songs. One of the things that has always stuck out to me is, um, uh, I believe it was 1994, uh, NHL, uh, EA NHL hockey. Right. I think it was 94. The, the song that was the opening song for, when the game came on and everything was heroes. Oh yeah, uh, and it's and it's this awesome graphic of the skate coming across the ice, uh, and maybe it was later than that. I can't remember, but um, uh, I played the shit out of that game, and it was right when I started playing hockey. Right, uh, and it was really powerful emotionally, and I've just inex- I've just tied that song to hockey playing, uh, to playing hockey, and to watching hockey, and um. Uh, it's just it's the most perfect match, and then Heroes, of course, was uh, also in uh, Moulin Rouge. But um, Changes and Space Odd. I mean, there's just so many, so many Ziggy Stardust, amazing, amazing songs, and uh, it's a great, great loss. So I know there were there were uh, outlaws that also uh, were saddened by his loss, and so yeah. uh, you know, in the absence of knowing him personally and feeling a personal loss from him being gone, I, I would just you know say that we honor the the body of work that he created, and you know, um, uh, um. Oh God! Who plays Scotty in Star Trek? James Doohan. Are no. you talking about the, the new <laughs> in, one, Sim- Simon yes, Pegg? Yeah. Simon Pegg. Yeah, Simon Pegg put out a great tweet, and he said, "You know, for those of you that are really sad about it, just think about it this way: the world is four billion years old, and you had the dumbass luck of being alive at the same time as David Bowie." That, that was exactly what I said when Christopher Lee died. I said, "We got to share oxygen on this planet with Christopher fucking Lee." You know, yep. but, like you know, some of us more than others. You know. Uh, yeah. it, we're lucky to have to have shared a little bit of elbow room with people like this, and yeah, you know, it, it's true. Uh, you know, like Bowie has actually like he's kind of been back on my mind in the last year or so. Uh, well, it really since since Guardians of the Galaxy came out, you know, and and Moon Age Daydream is on that soundtrack, and that got me you know just going back and listening to the Ziggy Stardust album and just you know, you know like like kind of remembering like how how completely bonkers and just you know insane. Uh, you know, th- that concept album was, and just uh, you know everything that kind of uh, everything that you know that was kind of going on in that period of music. It was uh, it was really cool. I mean, Bowie was uh, you know one of those guys that was really doing something interesting with sort of the theater of rock and roll uh, there in the early seventies. It was uh, it's too bad. It really, really is. All right, Brent, um, to come along with us into the sunset, we have a ride along from. Uh, I believe first time poster, uh, Emerlon, e- Emerlon. I hope I'm saying that right. Emerlon writes for my ride along. I would like to ask you guys to ride along with me. Uh, and he writes, you might want to skip this part. As long as we're going to a donut shop, I'm with you. Uh, he writes, uh, he or she actually, I don't know. I've been listening to you guys since episode 30 or so of Epic Battle Cry. And I am sad to see the podcast come to an end as your voices have come to be a normal part of my life. I wish you both the best of luck in achieving an equal amount of greatness and amazingness as you both have done here. And while I may never have been a frequent poster, I have lurked a lot on both Epic Battle Axe and here, and the sites have been an important part of my life over the past few years. Uh, please, I hope it continues that way, because we're still here. Um, now, to the less sappy part. Some friends and I have just released our first game. It is just a stupid project, but I can student. hardly contain my excitement. It's a student, I'm so- it's a student <laughs> project, you Philistine. Oh, I'm so sorry, Everlon. It is just a student project, but I can hardly contain my excitement. I know that it is far from perfect and that I will probably be crushed under the weight of other things and criticism and whatnot, but I could not be prouder. It feels so great to have put it out there, and I want to share this with my fellow outlaws. I doubt that the game would even have been made if it was not for you guys, because some of your discussions are what got me to pursue an education in game design. I hope you guys enjoy my creation, and I hope this is a thing you guys can be proud of came out of out the outlaw community and he links to both the io he or she links to the ios and android 
uh, links here. The game, I have not played it yet. Where have I? I just saw this this morning, but the game is called Huckleberry Heist. Uh, I, I have to. Where did they get that I, name? I, I wonder where they got that name. Is that a reference? Is that a reference? I don't know. Um, so uh, check out the game. You know, I really. Um, I said earlier uh, how much pride it gives us to know that that uh, we've been impactful enough, and we not just Brent and I, but the community, uh, to encourage people to follow their dreams and pursue an interest in gaming and game design or any of their dreams. And uh, we want to do what we can to support you guys. Uh, so uh, you know, if, if anybody is out there, you know, obviously James Burton and the guys over at White Paper Games. Uh, uh, members of the Outlaw Gaming community uh, created an amazing game, Ether One. But if there's other, and I know we have other developers out there, but if there's games that that uh, you guys have made uh, that you want us to share, by all means, uh, please let us know. We're always happy to, to support members of the community that are working on games, and we like to share that kind of thing. So, thank you very much, uh, Emerlon, for for posting this. Thank you for your your very very nice words of support and love for the community. Uh, and for Brent and I, and also for sharing this game with us. I think people should go check it out. Um, and with that, Brent, I think yes. we will call it a show for the week. Okay. What do you say? I already said yes and okay. All so, right, then, fine. As usual, me. we want to hear what you guys think about everything we talked about this week, uh, whether it is Emerlon's game, Huckleberry Heist. Uh, also, uh, what we talked about uh, up on the road, Battlefield 4, Disney Infinity, Star Wars Commander, uh, obviously, in the clubhouse, we had a, a good long discussion, which is mostly me just just licking my chops about VR and the announcements that were made at CES. We want to hear your thoughts about virtual reality and those announcements and anything else that came out of CES. We'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. And up in the garage, we talked about XCOM 2, Rise of the Tomb Raider for the PC, no new Assassin's Creed coming in 2016, and the fact that Far Cry Primal has its own language being created by a stable of cunning linguists. We want to know what your thoughts are on that and everything related to gaming. As usual, he is Brad Adams. I'm Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>